You can't, you can't leave going to church up to your children. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Because if you leave it up to them, they'll stay in the bed every Sunday morning. But you've got to be like Joshua. Joshua said, I don't know what gods you're going to serve. You may serve the gods on the other side of the floods, or you may serve the gods in whose land you dwell, but as for me, I wish I had some noise, and my house, we will serve the Lord. At first reading, this passage of scripture is enigmatic and curious, perhaps. It reads and sounds like it doesn't even belong in the scripture because it's about a piece of iron swimming. The iron did not just rise. The Bible said it swam. That's a strange story. It's a mysterious story. But it's chock full of prophecy about the branch who is Jesus Christ. I want you to see, first of all, the axe head in its solemn condition. The axe head in the story is an allegory or a representation of humanity. Now, obviously, the place where they were in this school of the prophets was too straight, too small for them. Their numbers were growing so large that they needed a bigger building. And so they got permission from their master, their teacher, Elisha, to, to go and find a place where they could build a bigger building. And he gave them permission uh, to go to the Jordan and every man was given a responsibility to work felling trees so that they could gather wood to build a larger school. And when they were out there, all of them working at the prophet's behest, he gave them permission, they were out there not loitering, having fun, messing around. They were doing their assignment. But one of them who was cutting down a tree had an unfortunate mishap. The axe head that he was using to fell trees fell off and sunk at the bottom of the Jordan. Now he's in trouble because the axe head was being used to cut down trees. And if he cannot cut down trees, he cannot participate in the building of a larger school. He would be irregular while the other men are working. He cannot be standing there with an axe handle without an axe head. And to bring the story even further, the man is distressed because not only has he lost the axe head, but it was borrowed. It's at the bottom of the Jordan, borrowed, and his master comes along and he says, where did it fall? He showed him the place where it fell. He took a branch and threw it in the water, and that branch connected with that piece of iron and it came up to the top and not just rose, but it swam. And then 
Elisha says to him, take it up to yourself. And he took it in his own hands. Now that's the story. But here is what this story is all about. The solemn condition of the axe head. Obviously, the axe was made for a purpose. It was forged and fashioned, shaped and sharpened to be an instrument for the accomplishment of a particular purpose. We were made in the image of God, formed and fashioned, shaped and sharpened to accomplish some particular purpose. But we cannot accomplish the purpose for which we have been made if we are lost. Let me, let me see if I can make that make sense. Nothing is more useless than an axe head bereft of its calling. Nothing is of less use than a man or woman who has been born who has not found their calling. I wish I had a witness here. The Jordan is a place or a river of death. The Jordan River is often spoken of as crossing it to death. The Jordan empties into the Dead Sea. The lowest spot on earth. Nothing lives in the Dead Sea. The river of Jordan flows into the Dead Sea. This axe head falls into the Jordan and it goes down, down, down to the Dead Sea. And when you are lost, the only place you can ever end up is down. No psychologist can help you. No sociologist can get you out of your lostness. When you are lost, the only place to end up is down. Not only is it lost, but the man who owns it has some liability. Let me see if I can make that make sense. He lost the axe head, but it did not belong to him. He says, alas, my master, it is lost, and worse than it's being lost, it was borrowed. The soul that belongs to you is not yours. It's on loan to you. It has been borrowed and you have some liability for its lostness. Now, now, brothers and sisters, you and I did not choose to be born. Nobody asked us if we wanted to be born. Nobody consulted us about our birthday. No one asked us if we wanted to be tall or short. Or no one conferred with us about if our hair was going to be straight or kinky. If our nose would be broad or pointed. If we would be black or white. No one uh, asked our decision about being born rich or poor. In Britain or Brazil. Nobody consulted with us about our genes or or whether or not we were going to be a boy or a girl, when we knew something, we were born. With no permission from us. With no input from us. But now that we are born, we have some liability. The liability rests on us to do something about our birthday because it will have eternal significance 
at our dying day. I think I should have saved this sermon for Sunday morning. This is a Sunday morning sermon. We are not responsible for the day we are born, but it will impact the day we die but be because between our entrance and our exit, we have some liability. Between our womb and our tomb, we have some liability. Between our birthday and our dying day, God is holding us responsible. We're not responsible for our birthday, and we don't know when our dying day is going to be, but that dash in between, that rests on your tombstone between your alpha and your omega, you have liability. The axe head is lost. Somebody has liability. Not only are you liable for yourself, but you're liable for other lost people. Somebody who's on their way to hell, you are liable to tell them that there is a way that seems right. Is there a Bible reader here? You have liability to get your children to church so that they can hear the preacher say the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. I'm glad my parents took responsibility, took liability for me, and made me come up to the church. I'm saved tonight because somebody took liability. I'm in the family of God tonight because my mama, my daddy took responsibility. You can't, you can't leave going to church up to your children. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Because if you leave it up to them, they'll stay in the bed every Sunday morning. But you've got to be like Joshua. Joshua said, I don't know what gods you're going to serve. You may serve the gods on the other side of the floods, or you may serve the gods in whose land you dwell, but as for me, I wish I had some noise, and my house, we will serve the Lord. It was lost. There was some liability. But in its lostness, there was limitation. When, when you are not in God's hand, as smart as you are, you still got limitation. You are not yet all you can be. Can you imagine Bill Gates in God's hand. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Can, can you imagine Warren Buffett in God's hand? With, with, with all of their genius, the fallen person faces at every turn limitations imposed on him by the fall in Eden. Until you deal with the fall, God can't get no use out of you. Until you rectify what happened in the Garden of Eden with the Garden of Gethsemane, God can't get all he wants to get out of you. And believe me tonight, the church is limited by the number of people within it who are still lost. Everybody who come to church is not saved. Uh, our elders put it this way. Everybody talking about heaven. Yeah, you got it. Ain't going there. Jesus put it this way. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because broad is the way. But narrow is the gate, and it leads into life. The solemn condition of the axe head, which represents our poor humanity, is that it is lost, and we have some liability for that lostness 
And as long as we are lost and not in God's hands, we impose upon ourselves restrictions and limitations. But now I want you to see, brothers and sisters, the sudden conversion. The man who was felling the tree lost the axe head. And he said to Elisha, Master, I've got to find it because it was borrowed. But he never would have found it had he not admitted that he lost it. Am I doing all right? You will never get saved tonight unless you admit you're lost. You will never get off drugs unless you admit your condition. You will never go to treatment. You will never get off alcohol. You will never turn your life around until you admit that there is some deficiency. You, you can hide it with makeup. You can mask it with a peppermint. You can go on vacation. You can move out to Sugar Land. But until you admit that you are hopelessly and helplessly lost, you will never get saved. Oh, brothers and sisters, I've seen the movie Titanic about 7,000 times. That's one of my favorite movies, along with the Shawshank Redemption. I've seen that I don't know how many times. And uh, at 11.40 p.m. on Sunday, April 14, 1912, uh, the ship of dreams, the unsinkable Titanic, set sail from Great Britain on the way to New York with the, with the profound promise and assurance that not even God himself can sink this vessel. It was deemed unsinkable. But at 11.40, on Sunday night, April 14th, 1912, the mighty Titanic ended up in two hours at the bottom of the North Atlantic. There were 2,207 souls on board, but there were lifeboats only for 1,178. And not many people on board knew that there was a limitation with lifeboats. But even at that, they were told that the Titanic was unsinkable. And they did not believe even when they got the report that the ship had been hit by an iceberg. As a matter of fact, the band still played. I wish I had help to preach it. As a matter of fact, uh, 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 Aster, who, who the Waldorf Astoria is named after, kept his tuxedo and top hat on because there were first class and second class and third class and steerage. But at 1140, everybody was in the Atlantic. There was no first class, second class, third class or steerage. Everybody was trying to get saved. 2,200 went in the water. 15,000 lost their lives because most of them on board did not recognize the danger they were in. And you know some folk gonna wind up in hell like that? Because they think their education, they think their family background, they think their beautiful face, they think their nice disposition is going to save them. But when the Titanic sinks, 
Don't matter if you went to Prairie View or University of Houston. Don't matter if you have a 401k. Doesn't matter if you live in South Lawn. It doesn't matter if you drive a Bentley or if you ride on Metro. When the Titanic sinks, everybody in the lifeboat is going to live. And everybody's in the water going to drown. That's why the Lord calls us who are saved to throw out the lifeline. Somebody's sinking today. Oh, I wish I had my 7.30 cry. That's why we got to sound the alarm because somebody's on their way to hell. When they, when they got him out of the water, lifeboats had maybe six or seven people in them, nine or ten people in them, because they didn't recognize until it was too late that the ship was going down. And sadly, sophomorically, people here preaching every Sunday. There are churches on every corner. There's a preacher almost on every channel. Have I got a witness here? But some people will not recognize until it's too late that the lifeboat is gone. That's why I preach so hard. Because I've got to warn somebody. Have I got a witness here? That's why I tell my family members, you better get in a hurry. I warn my nieces and nephews, hurry, you better get in church. My daddy used to pray, save my children before it will be a day and a time too late. Uh, and then finally, the axe head makes a silent confession. Look at it again. It, it, it has a solemn condition. It's lost. It's liable for its lostness. And as long as it's lost, it imposes upon itself some limitation. But then the sudden conversion is that it's going to be recovered because the one who lost it admitted it. Elisha never could have brought it up if the man didn't tell him where it was. Are y'all listening to me? The axe head never would have been recovered if the man had never admitted that he lost it. And you can't blame your lostness on nobody else. Come on, talk back to me here. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We had nothing to do with that. But since we are born, the gospel says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be Say, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, nowhere does it say you have to know all the books of the Bible. You don't even have to own a Bible. Just confess with your mouth, God, I admit I am a sinner. And you know what your problem is? Little old gal. That's what my grandmother used to say when you were too fast. She'd call you a little old gal. You know what your problem is, little old gal? You know what your problem is, little boy? You don't want to admit your condition. You, you, you go to church with them people, but you ain't like them. You sit down with them people, but you ain't like them. Because you've never committed any crime. Uh, you've never... Uh, committed adultery. You have never uh, colored outside the lines. You've always been in church. Uh, your daddy is a deacon. Uh, your mother used to sing in the choir. You've always known going to church. You, you, you don't need what those people need. But let me tell you something. There's nobody so good that they don't need to be saved. And there's nobody so bad that God can't save you. The reason I know that's true is because one Wednesday down in Eunice, Louisiana, I came to Jesus 
as I was. I was weary, worn, and sad, but hallelujah, tonight my testimony is I found in him a resting place. And he has made me glad. Anybody else here glad tonight? I said, anybody else here glad tonight? Anybody else here got some decisions you wish you hadn't made? Some roads you wish you hadn't traveled? Anybody here got some skeletons in your closet that if God took his hands off you, they'd fall out right now? But grace, mercy, he looked beyond. I'm, I'm, I'm through now. But I told you that axe head had a silent confession. Elijah cut down a branch and, 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 and he couldn't get down there with him just laying it down. He flung it into the Jordan. Now, nothing in the Jordan could save that iron because it sunk because of its metallic nature. It was its nature to fall down. It's in my nature to fall down. I wish I had some noise here. I'm a liar by my nature. I'm no good by my nature. I am a sinner by my nature. And what the iron fell in couldn't help it. It fell at the bottom of a dead river. And my nature takes me to places that can't help me. The crack house can't help me. The nightclub can't help me. I need something in the water that's alive. When he cut that branch down, what was in the branch was life. And when that life touched that dead thing, not only did it rise, but it started swimming. Thank you for tuning in to A Call to Joy. It is our prayer that the Word of God has brought joy, strength, and faith to your life. We would love to have you as our guest at Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church, where we are exalting the Savior, equipping the saints, and evangelizing the sinner. For your convenience, we have a 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. worship service every Sunday morning and 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights. Lily Grove is located at 7034 Till Wester Street, Houston, Texas, 77021, or feel free to visit our website at www. Lilygrove.org. Until next week, God has called us to a life of joy. <laughs>